Welcome, everybody. It's hour number two of Talk Back Now, brought to you by the Mustard Seed Asian Cafe at Southgate Mall, Kootenai Creek Village, the maintenance-free active adult community in Stevensville with the best of Western Montana living. Dig it excavating, where they bring 30 years of excellence to every job. For all your excavation needs, call Glenn at 214-4292. And Transport Equipment, your headquarters for RV service maintenance and repair. Do exceptional work on service vehicles as well. Located at 9300 Inspiration Drive. All right, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we appreciate uh, Dr. Ryan Marshall being with us uh, for the first half hour on Health Talk. Now we're into uh, we're open phones, but we have a special guest, John. Yeah, that's right. If you read your Missoulian this morning or uh, followed this issue at all in the, the recent opinion, past, the opinion page, yeah. Brad Sheeta has been uh, deeply involved in an issue involving the governor and an airplane, uh, and we thought we'd get him on uh, just to kind of talk about what. Uh, his view of things uh, is uh, the mayor hit you pretty hard in his piece this morning, um, uh, highlighting the fact that uh, that the governor had come over to talk about the bridge here in town that was crumbling and and to go to a funeral and things like that. And these were important things for the governor to do. Um, I kind of wanted to get you to give your side of the story. Why was all this attention brought about uh, in regards to the airplane? What are you trying to get people to look at? Good morning, gentlemen. There's a couple of things that uh, are indicative in, in, in this situation, or at least uh, worthy of, of some further evaluation. And it's not that I'm, uh, I don't have any vendetta you know, with, with Governor Bullock in an airplane. Last session, when we looked at the use of the King Air, first thing we looked at is what's it designed to do? It's designed to fly distance. So flying from Helena to Butte, Anaconda, Bozeman, Missoula, or Great Falls is a poor use of that craft, and it costs more money and more time to have that plane readied and the flight to be conducted and ground transportation to be arranged than it does, arranged than it does to have the governor get in uh, a state motor pool vehicle and drive to those five places and possibly even uh, other locations he was going to. And when we looked at the cost of it, we could have saved the state uh, over the biennium about a half a million dollars. And we figured that that was noteworthy. And it didn't matter whether it was a Democrat governor, Republican governor. You know, there's been all kinds of comments about, well, you know, in, in the past, both uh, both parties have used it. And I agree, both parties have, but I think it's a poor use of, of that equipment for the, the kinds of things that, that were being done with it. So we had, uh, had been informed that uh, the governor had planned some campaign events and then had scheduled state business after them. There had been some instances of that. Uh, Bozeman and Billings had been two of those where that had been purported. And I haven't gone out to do uh, my own research to determine that, but that was what was stated. So that was uh, at least what initiated the conversation and the uh, evaluation. But even if the, the governor were doing state business and then decided to, after the fact, uh, conduct some sort of campaign event, it seemed to me that it was uh, necessary for him to comply with the uh, the rulings of the COPP that you could not have an unfair advantage over your uh, opponent by using uh, something that gave you that distinct advantage. And I, I wanted to, I'm going to segue a little bit away from that and, and kind of toss in why this um, has affected a lot of uh, individuals who are running for office. When I campaigned in 2014, I had some signs purchased with donations that I received uh, from my campaign, which, by the way, were not purchased with dark money. Um, they were, they were dollars that were all disclosed, but uh, I have those signs sitting in my garage, and I've stored them, and I haven't charged myself any cost for storage. And I have wire uh, hangers for them or wire um, uh, wires that go on the ground to hold them up. When I use those this time, I have to declare those as an in-kind contribution to myself for really? my campaign. Really? Yeah. Even though they've yeah. already been paid for? They've been paid for, I but because I have possession of them, I have to I have to use, or I have to, to notify the COPP that this is an in-kind contribution. So if the governor is using the plane for state business and for campaign purposes, it seems to me a very legitimate um, uh, request of us to him to declare the use of the plane, at least 50 percent or whatever corresponding percentage would be reasonable, as a an in-kind contribution to his campaign from the state of Montana. So... If you feel that he or others have, the people that you getting this information from in Billings and Bozeman, if you feel the governor has broken campaign finance law in some way, why not file a, a request with the Political Practices Commissioner? 
that's something that we're considering doing. We haven't we haven't moved ahead with that yet because this was just brought to our attention here in the last probably week and a half, maybe two weeks. So it's not something that um, that we've had, at least that I haven't had a lot of uh, time to deal with. So you know, working working full time and handling le- handling legislative responsibilities, among other things, does not lend itself real easily to just dropping everything and picking it up and, and uh, working toward a resolution of it. But it's something that still hasn't been taken off the table. We want to investigate and evaluate it because there have been rulings in the past from the Commissioner of Political Practices about unfair advantages and about what must be declared. And, you know, I, I believe that there is some justification for the governor to have to at least declare a portion of this as a, uh, a campaign expense. Now, Brad, we've been hearing a lot, uh, especially after the sheriff's campaign uh, a couple of years ago, uh, about the, uh, the the work of the uh, pol- the Office of Political, pra- or the pra- Political Practice Commissioner, Mr. Modell. And, and the many ways that he has become involved in, in the political process, one one of those major ways is a trial uh, that's been proposed against uh, Representative Art Wittick uh, and the fact that it's been appealed to the Supreme Court to see if he even has the ability to have standing in that case. So uh, uh, do you feel that there's a problem with, with the, the office itself or just the person who's in it? Probably both, Peter. I think greater the greater share is the office itself because as uh, uh mr modal has um uh, has expressed he is the um the the judge the jury the the chief witness and the attorney in this matter so he he wears those four different hats. He's investigating, he's prosecuting, he's testifying, and he's rendering a decision. And I think that in itself is, uh, if, if that's the way the office is designed, it's a poor design of that office. It should not be a uh, an appointed position, number one, if that's the case, because obviously there's going to be a political leaning in well, that regard. Well, so, in the uh, Wittick case, there's one step further, because he's also the complainant. He's the one who brought right. the case. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so you know, really, uh, under those circumstances, I think that there needs to be some sort of buffer, some sort of distance between the person who's in that job and um, uh, any kind of a political appointment. It might be an elected position, but it could it can swing both ways. We understand that, that you know, if there was a conservative in there, that uh, that it could be used as a hammer against uh, someone who who uh, they didn't see eye to eye with. But it's interesting that all the uh, the formal charges that have been uh, that have been brought forth by that office in, in the last uh, five or six years have all been against Republicans. And when he, when, when Mr. Modell was asked why that was, he said, because Republicans were the only ones that have violated campaign laws. Wow. So, well, we're, we're going to take a, can you hang with us for a second? I can. We're sure. up against a break, and we have a caller from Pete, uh, uh, Pete, rather, who's waiting to visit with you. We also have a line open at 721-1290, visiting with, with uh, Representative Brad Sheeta, uh, who lives right here in the Missoula area. We'll be right back. Okay, we're back on uh, Talk Back. Our guest on the telephone is uh, Brad Sheeta. Uh, go ahead, John. Yeah, we got a quick question from Katie. She says, does the state own a smaller two- or four-six-seater that would be better and cheaper for use for smaller distances? Brad, do you know? Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know if that's the case. I think there are some smaller crafts. But I think they're, they're owned by FWP, and you know, they, they could potentially be used for that purpose. But still, again, you know, the... The amount of time it takes to prepare the the plane, to have the pilots ready, you know, to to log the flight, to get everything taken care of. I mean, driving, I drove from Missoula to Helena, you know, every week during the session. And even in in inclement weather, it's a two-hour drive. So, you know, it's it's not a difficult um, trip to make. So... It just doesn't seem to me that there's a lot of um, I'm, there's a lot of need for for an airplane on shorter trips. That I mean, you know, if you look at, at Governor Roscoe, there were there were uh, legendary tales of people, you know, being uh, out of service or off the road and having a car stop by, and it happened to be the governor, and he was driving to places. And you know, and I just say, you know, I use that as an illustration of what could be done. And I think in times when when the economy is uh, troubling and when we, we need somebody to set an example. That's what a leader does. They step up and say, look, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna, i do this even if it's a little bit of a sacrifice. And yes, can he be more effective and get more work done? Yeah, obviously, if somebody else is driving, he could do the same thing as he could if he was riding in an airplane. So I, I got, think that... I, I got to ask you, though, I mean, I, I can imagine in a state like Montana, big state, right, about the size mm-hmm. of Germany, roughly, uh, we, we got pretty uh, small towns on the fringes. The, the only quick way to get in there, in many of these cases, is to fly in there. If there was some kind of tragedy or event that happened and you needed to get the, the governor there within the day, 
a flight would maybe be the only way to get there. Absolutely. I agree 100 percent. But but where are those communities? Those are communities like Glendive, Sydney. Um, you know, if, if you're talking about in the southeast, I don't know if you, know, if you could count Baker in there because I don't know if there's a place to land there, but Miles City, um, you know, Kalispell, Dillon. Yeah, you can, you can fly to those places from Helena, and it makes sense to do that. But when you're talking about um, Great Falls, which is 80 miles away, you're talking about Missoula, which is 115 miles away. When you're talking about Butte, which is 80, 80 miles away, and Anaconda, which is 100 miles away, it does not make sense. Now, now I, th- I think we need to differentiate between the governor, you know, using a state plane for official business, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, like going, coming to Missoula to look at the bridge or whatever, if there was an emergency situation there, and not necessarily having a political uh, 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 part to it. Uh, but if it was, if, if it was purely simply for campaigning, I, obviously that that would be pretty egregious. Well, I think Brad's right. point is beyond that because he's saying even if you're coming to Missoula right. for official purposes, drive your car. It costs mm-hmm. a third as much. Okay. If yep. if if even less than that. So right. why spend the state's money when you can get there in a in a more economical fashion? Yeah, and the same amount of time. And I, I think there's there's two issues right there. You know, the the, the, the appropriate use of that plane, and then just using using the mode of transportation that uh, is going to be. Uh, equally uh, timely as well as far less uh, expensive to do. Now, have you have you ever studied the plane logs and found out how well, how frequently the plane is used to go to these smaller stops, as opposed yeah. to the you know Dillons and the Glen dives? Mm-hmm. When when we were looking at it during um, uh, the last legislative session, there were I believe and these numbers are are a little bit rough, right around 160 flights that the plane used over the the previous biennium. And of those, I believe it was 47 flights were to Great Falls, Butte, Bozeman, uh, Anaconda, Missoula, to so shorter hops. And there were some there were some uh, uses of the plane where the governor wasn't in it, or members of his staff, whether it was um, you know someone from one of the departments or you know his uh, budget director were using the plane to fly places. Okay, let's get back to the phones, and Marilyn is up first. Hi, Marilyn, you're on with Brad Sheeta. Go ahead. Good morning. First of all, this idea that Democrats don't use dark money is the biggest, fattest lie I've ever heard a Democrat tell. But anyways, um, I got a weird notice in the mail last week from Jonathan Modell. <laughs> he says, I have a pact called Current Conservative United. Really? And that I haven't filed my papers, and I haven't done this, and I haven't done that, and they're going to terminate it, and blah, 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 and and boy, am I in big trouble. Well, guess what, Jonathan Modell? I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I've never had a pack called Conservative United. But I know I'm probably on a list of being a god-awful conservative in this state, so gee... I mean, what's that all about? I've already I, tried calling twice this morning. Nobody's okay. answering their phone. Okay. I'm trying to figure it out. Well, he's, he, it's funny because he's usually pretty accessible to media I don't, I, folks. I don't here. think they open up till 9, but yeah, he is yeah. usually pretty easy open to get a hold of. Open up till 9. I started calling at 9. I called during the commercial breaks that huh. we've had. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, 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 let well, us I know. thought government offices opened at 830. That's what I've always been yeah. told. Right. Okay. Anyways, well, I found it pretty interesting. Well, good luck. Let, let us know how it comes out. Don't. Yeah, I will. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, one of the things that Marilyn can do is um, ask for Mary Baker or Ken Trujillo, and they'd be able to help her out. Uh, they're two very, very um, fine young ladies that work in the office, and they're very much on top of things. And, and they they understand, you know, the, the ins and outs of, of PACs and of individual candidacy, uh, campaign candidacies. So they should be a, a good resource to okay. check in with. Let's get one more call in before we have to take a break. Jay, you're on with Brad Sheeta. Go ahead. Good morning. Yeah, well, you know, we could get rid of this, these airplanes and replace them with horses and buggies. <laughs> this is the most ridiculous thing. Yeah, uh, the most practical way from one place to another is by air, and it has been since the inception of flight. Uh, you know, the... The, you know, and safety, and safety. You know what the most dangerous part of any flight is? The drive to the airport. The safest way that anybody can go anywhere is by air. And the statistics prove it out. Well, I guess right? I, I would... Economically. Yeah, and economically, an airplane uh, it costs money on the ground, 
but it's economic when it's in the air. It's actually making you money. So uh, I, uh, I have to take issue with that, Jay, because actually uh, the uh, gentleman who's a fixed-wing uh, mechanic, uh, Ryan Osmondson, indicated that the cost of leasing a plane like that is $1,650 an hour and at least $1,000 an hour to operate. And the time it takes to drive from Helena to Missoula is less time than it takes to coordinate the entire flight from the inception of the flight and the, and the logging of the flight with uh, local control and the FAA. It takes much longer to do that. And as far as safety goes, this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but uh, the last governor to be killed in office was Governor Nutter in 1962, and he died in an airplane crash. So I know it's not statistically relevant that one, you know, one flight indicates a, a safety factor, but you know the, uh, um, the use of the airplane, getting back to the point, is that... Uh, if you can save money at the state level, why don't we do that, especially when it's more economical from a time and a cost standpoint? You know, you sound, you sound like an anti-aviation person. <laughs> and I have Gosh. all my life been involved in one way or another in aviation. I, I guess all the flights I've taken I, and then indicated when I was seven that. years old. <laughs> hey, hey Jay, Jay, I'm a pro-aviation guy, but I think even you, you would have to recognize. Yet. Hold on real quick. Jay, I, I think you'd have to recognize that sometimes it's more efficient to drive than to fly, right? Wrong. R never? It's never more cost-efficient or time-efficient to drive? If I want to go downtown Missoula, I'm going to drive. I knew a guy whose son had an ultralight airplane, and he flew two miles to school every day. Wow. I know a guy who flew his, uh, uh, his surplus PQ-14 airplane, uh... To, uh, to work every day. And uh, airplanes are used uh, and have been used for commuting to work and to school since forever. I've known quite a few people who use them for regular commuting. Well, Jay, that. all right, I, I appreciate your call. Thank you. I, I think <laughs> I, there aren't a whole lot of folks out there that could afford to own their own airplane, but... Maybe if Governor Bullock flew himself, that and, would be a good case for and that. And I, I, I would really pay money to see uh, uh, Governor Bullock in, a, in an ultralight. I, I, don't, I don't think the... Uh, insurance adjuster for the state of Montana would uh, look favorably on that. So we're, we're going to come right back. We're way overdue for a break. We'll be right back. And hey, we're back on Talkback, and I realize that Brad uh, Brad Sheeta is kind of pressed for time here. I, I know you wanted to address uh, the uh, the content that was in uh, Mayor Engen's uh, letter to the Missoulian today. So, Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. You know, I would just uh, send a message to uh, Mayor Engen that uh, while I could take a a page out of uh, his book uh, and accuse him of hate speech when he uh, refers to me uh, uh, using words that I didn't use, such as bilking the public or referring to the governor as a liar. Neither one of those were used in the, in the commentary. What I would uh, uh, mention to, the, to uh, the good mayor is that his responsibility as a leader is to set an example and set a tone, and he could have done a very uh, significant job or taken advantage of an opportunity to do just that today. So, you know, it's unfortunate that he chose to take the, the lower road, but, um, you know, that's his choice to make. But in this whole situation, my uh, my objective is, as uh, an elected representative, to look at what is in the best interest of the people of the state of Montana, as well as my district. And if we can save money somehow for folks, we save money for them. And whether it means that it's, it takes a little bit more time or the same amount of time, uh, if we can save money, we save money for folks. So, I appreciate you gentlemen allowing me an opportunity to be on the air this morning. And, uh, you know, if folks have uh, any questions, they can reach me at uh, uh, rep.brad.cheetah at mt.gov and leave any comments they want to on that, uh, that website, you know, whether they're constructive or otherwise. So thank you, gentlemen, again. Thanks, Brad. Take care. Good to talk with you. Let, let's continue on and uh, get as any many calls in as we can. Pete, I'm sorry that Brad had to go. Please go ahead, sir. Okay, just two comments. Uh, one, since that I'm personally aware of, all the way back to the Schwinden administration, the uh, governor's office has always, uh, from that point on, that I'm aware of it. They took a flight that included both campaign business, personal business, or state business. They uh, split the cost of the, not only the operation of the plane, but the crew and, and everything. It came out of their campaign funds for that. You know, I'm, procedure. I, I am not sure how all that works now with the tightened p c controls that uh, I know Mr. Modell, uh, the, uh, the Office of Campaign uh, uh, Political Practices, uh, I, I know that there's some sort of a balance there somehow, 
And I'm sure you're probably much better informed about that than I am. But I think people just, I mean, from the from a stamp to a letter to a, a party to a, a mailer, I mean, you have to be so careful now. Yeah, so it's, it, it has been standard procedure to pay the portion of that. The other was with regard to the uh, Missoula Merck. I found that article by the structural engineer, and I think his name was Baudet. Yes. He done it for one of the previous buyers, uh, which were certainly informative. I suggest that the uh, new owners uh, dust off their phone book and contact him and get firm numbers on uh, how they can utilize some of that structure instead of operating out of ignorance. Okay, that's a great call. Thanks for thanks for your comment. Appreciate it. All right, uh, Tyler, you're on Talkback. Hi. Hi. So uh, since I don't get a comment because he's there anymore, I'll just throw it out there for the caller before the last caller that you just had, who was arguing in favor of flights. Yes. Um, the veterans that go to the VA clinic here and that need um, a professional consult have to drive to Fort Harrison. That's two hours away, and then they have to do an appointment, and then they have to drive home. So in order to do one appointment at uh, VA Fort Harrison clinic, it's an all-day event for every vet that goes out there. Right. Whether they get a voluntary ride from the DAV which is a free ride. With the, you schedule an appointment, they come and pick you up, or you can meet them in town, and then you ride out there for free. It's literally an all-day event. Now, it sure would be nice to have planes for all the vets, or at least one plane for a group of vets to go out there every day, um, but that doesn't exist. So, with that said, I'd like to change the subject. Did you guys hear about the hell great, uh, Hellfire missiles that were being smuggled into Portland through Syria or Siberia? I, I did read about that, yeah. Crazy, isn't it? Pretty crazy. This, this stuff is coming into that country all the time. Sometimes it gets caught, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes nuclear material crosses the Mexican border, sometimes it gets found, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes missiles get shipped in from out of the country to weird locations, and sometimes they get found and sometimes they don't. This time they got found, thank goodness, but... Um, we, we all really just need to be paying attention and, hey, uh, you know, looking out for your neighbors. What's up? I was just going to say, I, let me read the article. P- Peter, had you heard about this before? I had not. Okay, let no, me read. This is you. real news. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks for your call, Tyler, and bringing this up. Uh, this is out of the AP, uh, Belgrade, uh, Serbia. Serbia's authorities are investigating reports that a cargo package bound for Portland contained two missiles with explosive warheads on a passenger flight from Lebanon. N1 Television said the package with two guided armor-piercing missiles was discovered Saturday by a bomb-sniffing dog after an Air Serbia flight flight from Beirut landed at Belgrade Airport. Serbian uh, Serbian media say documents listed the final destination for the AGM-114 Hellfire missiles as Portland. The American-made projectiles can be fired from air, sea, or ground platforms against multiple targets. The Serbian state news agency Tanjug reported that the missiles had been packed in wooden coffins and unloaded at Belgrade Nikola Tesla Airport where they were inspected by bomb-sniffing dogs. This type of missile was originally designed to be fired from a helicopter and was named Helicopter Launched Fire and Forget Missiles, later shortened to Hellfire. <laughs> the AGM-114 model is manufactured by Lockheed Martin. Da, 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 da. I want to get that. Okay, here's the FBI. The FBI in Portland said it is looking into the reports. Quote, we don't have any information on this yet, Jennifer Adams, an FBI spokeswoman, said Sunday afternoon. In one reported Sunday that Air Serbia is helping the investigation, the Serbian flag carrier says security and safety are the main priorities for Air Serbia, end quote. Big questions. Where the American-made Hellfire missiles came from before they were being shipped back to America in a coffin would be on the top of my list of questions. Um, second, what, where were they going if uh, no one had caught them? Like, is there... Someone's supposed to pick them up the baggage drop? And is there is there some significance to them being in a coffin? I uh, could that be you know darkly meaningful somehow? Anyway, we're 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 overdue for a break. So uh, speaking we, of darkly meaningful, that bring out your dead uh, ad you used to do. Remember oh that? Gosh, yes. Don't do that. Huh. Uh, we're, we're we're having six shades of uh, of uh, separation here because Jason's standing right here. Anyway, uh, right. we're we're, we're going to come right back with uh, we'll talk back. We have a special celebration coming up here with Double Front, and we're going to talk about that. When we'll take more calls when we're done with that. So stay with us. 
All right, we are back, and uh, we're going to uh, just take a quick break here because our good friend Jason Herndon is joining us. How are you, sir? Good to see you. I'm doing well. Yourself, Peter? Fantastic. And Double Front is where it's at. I know it's it's one of the uh, one of the businesses that really uh, uh, just identifies Missoula, Montana, puts us on the map. Is double the Double Front Cafe? Yeah, that's right. Uh, been around for a while. The place was built in 1909. Yeah, before there was the colonel, there was the general, right? That's right. Thanks, Dre. That's right. So, wow, that's older than Peter, almost. F- hey, well, almost, <laughs> almost. Anyway, so so what's coming up? So the, tomorrow you're going to be doing a big uh, chicken giveaway or a sell off or an anniversary? Yeah, a big anniversary. It's our 55th anniversary in the Herndon family. And uh, we've been doing this for a number of years now, been coming in and, and talking with you guys. We do our regular chicken dinner for half price with no French fries. And the reason for that is we have to use every cooker we have in the house to cook chicken. So uh, big sale. We do it every year, right around this time of the year. And uh, it's something that we really look forward to. And you guys use like fresh chicken, right? Never frozen, right? That's correct. So yes. is there like a semi just stuffed full of chicken that's coming to Missoula right now for tomorrow? semis for the last several days and today and tomorrow so how many chicken total do you expect to go through so our original record we set a few years ago back in 2013 at uh 2107 chicken dinners (laughs) so that's ultimately the record um it's been a busy year this year so we've been promoting as much as we can but there is a good possibility that we'll tap that 2000 mark or maybe even a little more is there a Guinness record that you could even try to go for? You know, we tried uh, to get a record with Guinness, and um, we've been working with them a little bit. They have different categories, and they don't want to recognize uh, volume throughout a time period. They want to do a volume in, in like, one container, which uh, we could beat that, but we can't hold the food uh, for that long, so it's not usable. So we don't want to waste food. Oh, of so course we, not. we yeah. haven't we haven't um, attempted to beat that record because we want fresh chicken out to our people. What if that container was Peter? Oh stop it. Yeah. He could maybe <laughs> he loves chicken. Now, now now let me ask you this. What for those for those poor benighted souls out there, and God help you, if you've never had double front chicken, uh, describe the typical chicken dinner you're talking about here. I okay. mean, so we're talking minus fries. Sure, so. sure. So our regular chicken dinner is a half of a chicken. So it's a leg and a thigh connected, a wing and a breast connected. and on That's a lot of chicken. It, it is, yeah. And it's an uh, average of a two and three quarter to three pound bird. So you get half of that. And on any day out of the year, except for tomorrow, it comes with French fries. That's our most popular meal. It's what we're known for. Right. Um, we kind of stopped keeping track of how many we sold, but about five years ago, we were guessing that we were at about six or six and a half million dinners in the 55 years wow. that the families had the business. So, wow. Yeah. That's a lot of chicken. That's a, that's a few birds. And, and <laughs> is this a trade secret as to where your chickens come from? Uh, no, we, uh, we get our chickens from several different suppliers, um, and it just depends because we buy in so much volume. Uh, we may have a supplier that comes and says, "Hey, we have fresh chicken. We can sell it to you at this price for this long," and that's who we'll get our chicken from. But we always make sure that it's fresh, never frozen, and that it's hor- no, hormone what? free and is. Let's see. Let, what, 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 what is the deal with not having frozen chicken? I mean. Uh, you, you go into the grocery store, there's frozen dinners everywhere. Yeah, frozen chicken, you know, it has its place. But at the volume that we go through, it's, it's um, well, a few things. The taste of fresh over frozen is a little bit better. Um, but it's also real hard at the volume that we go through. If it comes to us frozen, trying to thaw it out and right. work it. Because we get our uh, chickens whole, and we f- do the finish processing. So we split them in half and quarter them trim them um, in-house. We don't, we don't get them ready to cook. How so. long does that take if you're in a hurry? I mean, I, some of you, you guys are really good. I mean, if you can bang, bam, bam, get that done in a hurry. <laughs> it's a chop how, shop. How, how long does it take? So we have, we have like two dedicated chicken cutters. That's all they do. They don't work any other position. Wow. And they come in, and we run it on a power saw that scares 
the bejesus out of me. <laughs> because from t- from time to time, when we're running a little thin and uh, and our chicken cutters can't get in, I'll have to go down and cut a case or two. And and I'm afraid of this thing. It is an absolute monster. But these two professional chicken cutters that we have, they can run a bird through. I mean, they nip the tail, nip the nip the neck, cut it in half down the backbone, down the b- breastbone, in half, trim the fat about as quick as I just said that. So the only people that own this machine are like you and Bond villains. Yeah, right. It's uh, yeah, and and it's kind of funny because it's downstairs. We. Uh, we're one of the last few businesses that are, uh, we have a room under the front sidewalk on Alder Street, and we still have the steel doors in the sidewalk. Wow. So you open them up, and that's where we get our chicken delivery. And everyone calls this uh, room the dungeon because it says white. <laughs> Maybe you are a Bond small, villain. <laughs> <laughs> this, this, this small white tiled room with this mean saw in the corner and uh no it's um coming soon the spy who ate the we chicken need, yeah. we need a chicken cutting laser that's right <laughs> yeah. you could do a horror f- film in it maybe no but it's uh, it's where we process all of our chicken uh and uh it's not as bad as i i make it sound to be but okay so give give us the facts what's coming on tomorrow okay so tomorrow's our 55th anniversary from when to when uh from 9 a.m when we open until 11 p.m when we close <laughs> Unless if we ha- shoot 2,200, 2,300 dinners out tomorrow until we run out of birds. So. It, 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 is, it, is it okay to pre-order or do yes. we have to start at 9 a.m. or what? Uh, you can pre-order and um, uh, call ahead. The number is 543-6264 and uh, order ahead. Tell us how many, how many chickens you want. And believe it or not, how we run it, we don't even take names tomorrow. Normally, if you're a regular call-in... You'll want to give us your name, except tomorrow we just need to know how many birds you want and when, because we put it on our sheet so we can keep the proper number of chicken ro- wow. rolling. Yep. Wow. All right. Well, best of luck to you, man. Hey, thank you very much. It's a pleasure guys. seeing you. It's always a pleasure. I was hoping you're going to bring us some samples, but I... well, I think that happens tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> fine. Fine. Hey, thanks a lot, Jason. Thanks, Peter. Always a pleasure to see you. Thanks a okay, lot, John. We're, we're, we're overdue for a break. We have callers waiting that have nothing to do with chicken, and uh, we're going to be right back. Stay with us. Okay, getting back into our regular open phones business. Uh, I want to thank Jason Herndon for stopping by. Uh, let's get right to the phones and say thank you to Mike for holding. So, Mike, you're on. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I'm all in favor of the governor flying his airplane to Missoula. As long as he has a bicycle tied to the wing so somebody can drive, ride on these high-priced bicycle lanes we're building for a million dollars a mile, that would be really great. <laughs> okay. Right. Thanks for your call. And one other thing, one other thing. Did I hear you correct that Friday that say this is going to be your last call-in show for a while? Well, mm. no, just Peter won't be on for a while. Oh, uh, we'll have, we'll have, uh, oh, I'll be honest, going... though, I mean, when Peter's gone, it's way harder for me to do call-in shows. So I usually have guests, um, but we have a couple scheduled over the next week. And so he's going to England, huh? Yeah. I am. Yes, I am. And Thank yeah, you. Well, yeah. All righty. Well, get in the cab and tell him to take the parts where, where you people just don't leave, generally go. You got it. And you, I can tell you right now, if you want to know how that's done, that's pretty good. That that's one. okay. All right. Thanks, yeah, thanks, Mike. Appreciate the call. Alan, you're on Talkback. Hi. Yeah, good morning. I've been asked by a group to announce a meeting that's coming up. There's a new group forming here in the Bitterroot, and they're calling themselves Advancing Conservatism. They're going to hold their first public meeting March 21st, which is a week from today, at 7 p.m. down at the Hamilton Senior Center, and that's located at 820 North 4th Street in Hamilton. And their speaker will be Nancy Balance, Representative Nancy Balance. Nancy will be speaking on the refugee issue okay. and what the state legislator may be doing about it. All so, right. Thanks for the call. So I've announced. There you go. <laughs> thanks, Alan. Always Your a pleasure, first job sir. is uh, finished. Thank you very Accomplished. much. Uh, Elena, thank you for holding. You're on Talk Back. Go. You're welcome. Thank you. I don't know if anybody's mentioned this um, on the, the show, but today is the deadline to file for elections. Oh, that's right. I did mention that on the news today. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and the reason why I'm mentioning it here is because I'm stressing the point. Uh, you, and you can do it online. For state legislators, it's $15, and there's no reason why you can't. 
You can always change your mind later. There's still about 30 unopposed um, seats, which is ridiculous. Um, you've heard of the term protest voters? Mm-hmm. Well, there should be protest filers because a protest voter has no way to pro- uh, put their vote in if there's only one person on the ballot. Well, you know what's really interesting, Elena? Because uh, th- this was actually a news item. There's a gentleman named Nick Chesney who has filed to run against Governor Bullock in the primary. Yep. And, w- I, and, th- and they said not only did he file to run against Governor Bullock, but he's already also sent a check in to Governor Gullick, Bullock's campaign supporting him. Now, and the reason the, the news story intimated to that the reason money. he did that, no, is so that the governor has over $650,000 in his primary campaign that he can't use sure. unless somebody's running against him. Right, you so know, he wants to I, use the money. It's what it's, I yeah. saw that, and I didn't understand that. But now that you explained it, how do you like that? Well, there you go. Thanks a lot, Mr. McChesney. You know, see, this is the other side, and I don't care. Put your label on it. They know how to organize. They know how to do things. And to me, you know, having a protest vote, a filer, you get your name on the ballot. So you've got a person who uh, is protesting the incumbent. He'll vote for you. Or they just like you, and they decided we need a change, and they'll vote for you. So yep. you automatically, well, you're going to vote for yourself, so you got three votes right there. There you go. Well, please, people, do it, okay? The worst thing that we can have is an uncontested seat. Gotcha. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Elena, for sure. We're up against a break. Go ahead. I will give a quick warning. For some of those offices, like Governor, you have to pay a fine. You have to pay a, 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 an yeah. entry fee, basically, right. which is a percentage of the amount that that person earns. Luckily for you, state legislators earn almost nothing in Montana. Right, exactly. So <laughs> You could actually get a rebate from... Uh, no, just kidding. Uh, we'll be right back after this one-minute timeout. Thanks for calling, KGB. Oh, yeah. 721-1290 is the number. Let's move right along. We have about six minutes left in the program. Let's get as many calls as we can. Hi, Andy. You're on TalkBack. Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for taking my call. I just wanted to give a uh, belated but uh, uh, shout-out to the Bitterroot Valley Board of Realtors I don't know if they co-sponsored the anti-refugee meeting in Hamilton a couple weeks ago, but if it wasn't for their uh, their involvement, the crowds wouldn't have been there, and I just really uh, appreciate them for putting in the call out. Also, it's something John would appreciate. Would, uh, I looked up trumpery in the, uh, in the <laughs> dictionary the other day, and it said showy but worthless. <laughs> there you go. It's, it's true. You, you can't argue with the truth. Thanks. Thanks for the call. <laughs> appreciate it, man. All right. Uh, Jerry is up next. Jerry, thanks for holding. You're on TalkBack. Go ahead. Good morning. I'm a, I'm a lifelong Republican, a disabled veteran, and if I want to fly to Helena, then I should take time out of my life, run for governor, get elected, and then I'd be able to fly. There's There's got to be some perks to the office. He's the governor of our state, for crying out loud. So, so you think it's okay for him to, to 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 fly wherever he needs to go for convenience sake, or what? Well, it's got to be a quote for official business. Yeah, but absolutely, he's the governor of our state, and okay. I'm sure he should be able to fly it. Like I said, if I wanted to fly there, I need I should take time out of my life, run for governor, get elected, and then I too could I could too could fly around for official business. Okay, well, I certainly take that. Thanks, Jerry. Okay. Appreciate the call. All right, uh, why not? Emmett, you're on TalkBack. Hi. Oh, thanks for taking my call. Yeah, it's a bit late. I got up a little while, um, a few minutes ago, but you're going to be gone to England for a while. About how long again? I'm going to be gone for eight days. Okay, yes, okay. thank you. Yes. Are you going to Scarborough Fair? Uh, no, I'm not going to Scarborough Fair. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm sure you've been talking about Trump a lot and the riots that happened with the communist sympathizers. You know, I'm still a big Trump supporter. I got online. I don't like his stance on homosexuality because it's too liberal, but I like his other stands. But those millennial communists that, you know, came in and did that horrible riot really angered me and on Saturday. They actually shut down the event. Now, I hate Hillary Clinton, and I hate, you know, um, Barack Obama, but I would never disrupt one of their rallies, scream and punch people and tear up people's signs as, you know, let the democratic process run out, but these liberals who preach tolerance have shown who they are, the most intolerant communists 
in the world are the most hateful people, and all they did was shut down a Republican form of government, you know, and just take away our vote, take away our speaker that we wanted to see whether you liked him or not, Donald Trump, just because they said, we won't allow this, you can't say this, or whatever. It is the most intolerant, that's what they do in totalitarian communist countries like, you know, China or North Korea, worse. And um, these liberals have shown their true colors, and Trump was not at fault. He's only been telling the truth, I think. And, you know, a lot of people just hate it the way it is, and they really want So we not, need to pray for Donald Trump and pray for this nation, you know. What, what do you think we should pray for? Just that for his Donald safety Trump or for something else? And that we could get good Christian values back, and we could convert these people to Jesus that were causing all these riots. You know, one person called in and said, I always talk about my faith. How can I support Donald Trump with this? Well, you know, thing is, Donald Trump has self-esteem. In, you know, in politics... You have a right to fight back against your opponents and say these things. Obviously, I couldn't go to the grocery store and you know, yell at people and whatever. I mean, but when you're in politics, you're wearing a different hat. That's not the place to turn the other cheek. And he's just standing up to these communists. And it's our duty, in a sense, to sir, save Christendom. So, you know, that's the way Wait, I feel. You so know? You, you see Trump as some kind of knight in shining armor to defend Christendom. I do, actually. He is a Christian. I do read have read his book. He was baptized a Presbyterian, confirmed a Presbyterian, and he's like a knight in shining armor for this country, I think, you know. A friend of mine and I were talking about it, and maybe the Lord has risen him up at this time to really help this nation. He's a Trump supporter, too, you know. Yeah, the Lord did that with Pharaoh at one time. I'm sure he could do it again. Well, you know, the Moses, yeah, and the whole thing, he's like another Moses, I think. Oh, uh, my I gosh. think he's more like the uh, Pharaoh. Okay. But, I but, don't think he's the Pharaoh, no. Yeah. Well, a good Pharaoh, perhaps. The good All right. Pharaoh. Well, the, the Pharaoh was a builder, too, so <laughs> there you go. I, I, you might call him one of the ultimate uh, real estate developers. Well, so. the Pharaoh was maybe more inclusive. He wanted the refugees yeah, to yeah. stay. Yeah, exactly, for a specific <laughs> purpose. <laughs> would you mind? Would you mind hauling that ten-ton uh, uh, yeah. piece of rock over here, please? And, yeah. and we'll make you feel good while you do it. So. There we go. Anyway, so we have like a minute left of the program, Mr. King. Yeah, yeah. So tomorrow uh, we'll have uh, Dan Bucks on the show, former director of the Department of Revenue for wow. the state of Montana. Okay. And he'll be talking a little bit about the process we're going under right now with the coal trust fund, the right. the, the disappearance. Of the coal industry, especially if this Washington legislative deal goes through. And Oregon's and, doing the same thing, by the way. So, or, or, or Oregon is, is advancing legislation very quickly to eliminate any sort of coal from its uh, investment portfolio in, in its energy. I mean, and that's going to mean liquidating whatever coal they're getting from wherever and replacing it with natural gas or hydro or whatever. They just don't want coal in Washington or Oregon. And that's where all of our coal is going to get uh, over to China. So so anyway, he'll be talking about that and what uh, Montanans should do or prepare for. Right. Um, of course, he's not the Department of Revenue director anymore. In fact, I don't even think he lives in Montana anymore. Yeah, I think yeah, he moved yeah. out of state to be with his family. You guys have a great day. Uh, watch out for the snow, and we'll see you tomorrow.